anyway, thanks so much, uh, Laura Michaels, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, planes, trains, and automobiles to get to Philadelphia this weekend. Uh, so I'm just going to talk briefly uh, about essential thrombocythemia, and I hope that by the end of this talk, I will have reviewed the new World Health uh, Organization criteria and what that kind of means in terms of our risk stratification um, systems for essential thrombocythemia and how it might change our initial treatment decisions. I hope that the case um, that I'm going to use talks a little bit about the role of molecular mutations in treatment decision making and also some of the challenges that happen when you're dealing with young people or any people with essential thrombocythemia and hopefully recounting some of the key data that supports upfront therapies. So. Um, this is a patient of mine. She's a 38-year-old woman who I was called about after she presented to an emergency room with a migraine. She had auras, vomiting. She'd been gotten on to antiemetics and Toradol, and actually she'd had several emergency room visits for migraine since her last pregnancy, but this is the first one where they drew a CBC. And so her white count was 13.5, hemoglobin 11.9, and her platelets were uh, 1,450,000 with a very mild um, microcytic anemia associated with it. Uh, she was, I didn't see her in the emergency room, I did see her um, the maybe that later that week, and she came in. And of course, the workup for any concern about a myeloproliferative neoplasm, like always, starts with a, a history. Um, of note, she'd had one miscarriage, um, but it had been seven years ago. Um, since then, she'd had uh, one live birth. She'd had one live birth before and one live birth after. She'd not had any significant bleeding. She'd never had a clot. We did go through her prior CBCs and her platelets had been slightly elevated at the time of her last pregnancy. Um, she did not have a physical, on physical exam, any hepatosplenomegaly, and we did an iron panel and checked a CRP and looked at the per peripheral smear. A bone marrow biopsy was later diagnosed, or done, and as part of that, we looked at cytogenetics to exclude the BCR able um, translocation, and we checked a JAK2 mutation. So one of the things to keep an eye out for on the um, pathology when you're looking at essential thrombocythemia is the nature of the megakaryocytes. You want to, um, the hypo, hyperlobated clustered megakaryocytes are sort of the sine qua non of the ET. And you want to make sure that there's no dyserythropoiesis in the, or left shifting in the uh, granulocytes and erythrocytes. So in terms of molecular testing, this comes up a lot, and a lot of the patients that I see in referral have had all of this testing done, the JAK2, the bcr able the CAL-R, and the MPL, certainly when you're looking to confirm something is clonal. But it's also perhaps even more prudent to do these sequentially. We know that the great major the majority of patients um, in myelof uh, essential thrombocytoma essential thrombocythemia will be JAK2 positive. So if that's positive, you don't, you don't need to go on and do the CAL-R or the MPL. So typically what I do is first we'll check BCR able and JAK2. I see these as sort of first line tests. If either one of those is positive, you stop. If they're both negative, then you do a reflex CAL-R. If that's negative, then the MPL. Again, you want to finish up doing the MPL because it's important to know that there is clonality there, of course. And if all three are non-diagnostic, then your choices are, is this a non-clonal disorder? Is this reactive? Do I need to keep looking for something else? It could be a hereditary thrombocytosis. These are very unusual, of course. Or triple negative ET, which occurs in about 10% of patients. This is the World Health Organization classification criteria, the new ones for essential thrombocythemia. The platelet count is the first thing, and I also want to point out that one platelet count of this is probably not enough. This, this needs to be somewhat recurrent. Um, bone marrow biopsy, again, they emphasize, and this is the key, one of the key differences, is to differentiate it from low-risk myelofibrosis or uh, sort of pre-fibrotic myelofibrosis. And the difference here is in the 
no changes in the neutrophil granule poiesis or the erythropoiesis. And again, essential thrombocytopenia, it's very rare to have significant reticulin fibrosis. And if you are getting fibrosis, then that's a case you want to think about as being, you want to talk to your hematopathologist, is this more likely to be myelofibrosis or as a prefibrotic myelofibrosis? Of course, what we need to exclude the BCR able translocation for CML. You want to make sure it doesn't meet criteria for PMF or myelodysplastic syndrome. RARST is one that can sometimes be confused with ET, and then the key here is to look at a iron stain and check for sideroblasts. The presence of JAK2, CALAR, or MPL will confirm that there's clonality there. The other thing to remember is that secondary essential thrombos uh, secondary thrombocytosis can of course, of course occur. The most common, especially in a woman like this, might be iron deficiency. Um, and you also need to think about people that I've had probably four or five referrals in my time with um, elevated platelet counts in individuals who've had splenectomies. So just, you know, those, that's just, those kind of things can occur. So about 50% of patients are, uh, completely asymptomatic at presentation, but while the burden of symptoms aren't, aren't severe, they are relatively promiscuous. So you will have people that then look backwards and say, well, you know, I have been much more fatigued. I have these headaches that I blamed on other things. Vaso um, symptoms like uh, erythromyalgia is relatively common, acroparesthesias, uh, TIAs can happen too, and all of these can be quite uh, clearly related to the vasomotor symptoms of ET. You also don't want to forget, and I think Brady probably talked about this, you don't want to forget when anybody has an abdominal clot, mesenteric or splanchnic clots, CVST, especially in women, young women, these are often blamed on their uh, OCPs, for example, and uh, it, it should still be a trigger to check a CBC uh, unusual muc mucosal bleeding. I have one patient who I on only met because she'd been to the emergency room four times with post-dental bleeding and was finally found to have platelets of more than two million. So in this patient, a repeat CBC showed similar findings. And again, this time her platelets were 1.6 million. She had moderate iron deficiency. Her erythropoietin was n low normal. She did have the bone marrow biopsy that we looked at, and her cytogenetics were normal, and she was JAK2 positive. So the questions that she asked me, and the ones that I think come up most often in clinic, is do I need to have cytoreduction? If so, why, and what should be chosen? Can I get pregnant again? And what's my likelihood of disease transformation or disease progression? This is a young woman, of course. So I think the key thing when you're looking at somebody with platelets of more than 1.6 million is do I need to cytoreduce this woman? And if we looked at the classical ELN criteria, the initial reason to, it, the use of a platelet count of more than 1.5 million, as you might have in this case, was something to drive people into the higher risk category. As Brady has relatively eloquently discussed, however, really thrombosis a uh, platelet count that that's high is much more of a risk for bleeding than thrombosis. In thrombosis, in EPT, like PV, we worry a little bit more about the, uh, first off, prior history, cardiovascular symptoms, genetic mutation, and white cell count. So, but certainly, it would be justifiable to be worried enough about this, pla this woman's platelet counts to think about cytoreduction merely for her elevation in platelet counts. If we look at the e IPSCT thrombosis scoring system, separately displayed here, she's in the intermediate risk category, entirely driven by her mutational status. So you get a JAK2 mutation gives you two points, again, outcome of which is being thrombosis, and that points to the fact that it's not the platelet so much as her mutational status that is driving her risk in this case. When we look at it in more of a revised category, she's had no prior thrombosis, she's under the age of 61, and she's positive for the JAK2 mutation, and that would put her in a low risk category. So you can see why she was confused when I went over this, well, do I actually need treatment or not? So I will tell you that platelets alone as a trigger to treatment is a debated issue. Um, 
there are pros to it. Um, we know that we want to treat before somebody ends up with a bad bleed or a clot. Um, we don't. We there's no long-term impact of the therapies, and it's certainly these therapies can provide symptom control. The cons is that you start the clock on therapeutics earlier on, and perhaps without a good and uh, outcome. Def, uh, reason that is truly outcome defined. There is some perhaps therapeutic resistance over time. There's certainly a financial impact and a side effect toxicity impact. So whether or not one uses platelets alone as a trigger should probably be driven by what are the outcomes you're worried about. And remember that thromb uh, thrombocytosis, much more of an outcome related to uh, bleeding. So in a patient where you had persistent elevation of platelets as the only reason to uh, think of uh, only trigger, you might want to consider looking at whether or not acquired von Willebrand's was present by testing, for example, the Ristocetin cofactor, and using that as a, if it was present, then using that as a reason to consider lowering the platelets with cytoreductive therapy. So in her, we decided to replete her iron and discontinue her oral contraceptives as a contraindication for the risk, as a second uh, risk for clotting. When we did that, with, the, with full iron repletion, we also tested her, as I mentioned, for von Willebrand's. She was not present, and her history was negative. With full iron repletion, her platelets declined into the 957, 950 mark, thus avoiding my need to make a decision about whether or not to start her on cytoreduction reduction because of extreme thrombocytosis. And this just points to the fact that altering things that aren't necessarily involving your chemotherapy can really be helpful sometimes. Now, should this pl patient be placed on aspirin? Again, she has a slight increase in platelets. The arguments for doing aspirin, now she's in this category. We've moved her down because now her platelet count is less, um, and mostly because we found a secondary reason for that thrombocytosis. And should she be started in aspirin? Well, one would argue that the two points in that IPSCT uh, and the fact that the JAK2 mutation is more likely to be related to vascular events. And those vascular events, as demonstrated in retrospective studies, include in particular arterial events, strokes, um, sometimes uh, CV, uh, strokes and uh, heart attacks, as we've discussed. It can also be extremely helpful in symptom re remediation. For anybody who's had patients with erythromyalgia, it can be an extremely symptomatic condition. People, um, I had one patient whose legs swelled quite significantly. She had a burning sensation. Other people had blamed it on Renaud's but had almost loss of feeling in their hands. And then migraines, of course. So aspirin can uh, help all of these. And I think especially in a patient with JAK2 positive uh, essential thrombocythemia, there is good data to support aspirin for either symptom control and for the fact of thrombosis prevention. We know that in retrospective studies, and in some of the, um, in retrospective studies, that the JAK2 mutation gives you a higher risk of arterial and venous thrombosis, and a slightly higher risk from, for progression from ET to polycythemia vera. It turns out that if a patient is positive for the CalR mutation in essential thrombocythemia, they have a lower risk of thrombosis relative to those who have the JAK2 mutated ET, but a slightly higher risk, again in retrospective studies, of progression to myelofibrosis. And triple negative cases are somewhat indolent disease, and they have a lower incidence of vascular events. So when I'm thinking about starting aspirin on an otherwise low risk essential thrombocythemia patient, I will use I will always start it if someone is JAK2 positive. If they are Cal R positive, I will discuss with them the uh, lower risks of aspirin, although if their platelets are high, that risk is not low. And then if they're JAK Cal R positive, I will also talk with them about uh, starting it if they have significant coronary artery risk factors and that or coronary disease risk factors, including, for example, um, any uh, diabetes, uh, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and of course, smoking. It should go without saying that everybody needs to stop smoking if they have this condition that can independently increase the risk of thrombosis in this population. <laughs> 
So what about observation versus antiplatelet therapy? And that's been looked at in two particularly interesting studies. In this one from blood in 2010, they took low-risk ET patients, and they, put, they found in this study that antiplatelet therapy reduces the clot risk in patients that are JAK2 mutated, and it reduces the risk of arterial thrombosis if cardiovascular risk factors are present. And that's the argument that I make for patients who have uh, either of those two to start aspirin. Uh, and then this data was uh, used and also updated uh, last year, and patients with JAK2 mutated patients who are on antiplatelet therapy had less VTE and no increase in bleeding, whereas there was an indication of in the Cal mutated patients of an, no impact on VTE risk, but an increased risk of bleeding on, in aspirin. And that's why I'm a little bit more uh, cautious when I started on people who are Cal reticulin mutated. So what are our goals of therapy? They're to prevent vascular catastrophe. Um, they are to manage disease symptoms and protect people's quality of life, to avoid therapeutic toxicities, and to delay or prevent progression to PV or myelofibrosis. Um, so for frontline, when we do have to think about site or reducing individuals, the question is, should that people be treated uh, in, a, in a high risk category? What data do we have to support hydroxyurea? The best two randomized studies are from 1995 and 2005. Um, these were both involving high-risk patients. In the uh, 1995 study, patients with extreme thrombocythemia, meaning patient platelets over a million and a half, were excluded from this study, and that's because they didn't feel they could safely treat them on the placebo arm. But this data certainly shows that there was less risk of vascular events, which was the endpoint in, and thrombosis-free survival is the endpoint in the Cortolazzo study, which is where we got the idea for using hydroxyurea. In this study, patients' platelets were kept under about 600,000, but again, I think more based on better, based on the sort of duration of information, I don't, when I start hydroxyurea, I don't necessarily aim to get under a uh, certain threshold all the time. Uh, the Harrison study, I think, is like 450-ish. Um, I will usually make sure I'm getting the white count down and keeping symptoms under control if need be and keeping the platelets less than what they were at the point of the last vascular event. The hydroxyurea versus anagrolide study is one that I'm sure you're also aware of. Again, looking at high-risk patients with a composite endpoint that included vascular events, uh, both arterial and venous vascular events. Uh, there is some data supporting anagrolide as first line. This is the sort of I think with the largest study that's looked at 259 untreated high-risk ET patients with a non-inferiority endpoint and showed that anagrolide was equivalent to hydroxyurea. Um, one of the things that might make this different than uh, the study published by the Brits in 2005 was that they defined essential thrombocythemia by the uh, World Health Organization criteria rather than by the polycythemia study group. And it may be that the Harrison uh, population, the cohort of patients there, were more likely to have fibrosis, more likely to have leukocytosis, therefore more likely to have had some benefit from the cytoreduction of hydrea rather than the platelet only reduction effects of anagrolide. So anagrolide is approved in the US, it's not approved in Europe, but it, um, as I understand it, I'm, I'm not entirely positive of that, but it's still not quite uh, first line, I think, in most uh, individuals. And what about interferon? So Dr. Mascarenas presented in 2016 the early results of the MPDRC trial that was a high-risk first-line randomization of pegylated interferon alpha versus hydroxyurea, looking at complete hematological response. At that time, so far, no significant differences between agents. It's early on in the study. Um, there were some overall grade three uh, adverse events in 14% of those treated with hydrea and 44 with uh, pegylated interferon. Um, the hematologic effects with hydrea um, and interferon are there and the non-hematologic there as well. There's, uh, again, no significant difference noted so far, but I think additional data is pending on that. So in 
just in general, the algorithm that we use in, in our clinic is first we make sure we've got our diagnosis confirmed and we understand the molecular mutations. If somebody has had JAK mutation assessed already, then we talk about their risk stratification based on the three models we looked at, and we make sure that everybody's cardiovascular risks are addressed. In individuals who have very low risk disease, they are JAK2 unmutated, they've never had a thrombosis, and they're young, I try and avoid even aspirin in those people, although I'll talk with aspirin about them. Uh, low risk individuals who are mutated, those people get aspirin. Intermediate risk um, and higher risk, then we discuss whether or not aspirin alone is appropriate or cytoreduction. And people with uh, cytoreduction, they're on aspirin and cytoreduction. I haven't used twice a day aspirin all the time. I've sometimes done it when people have had symptoms that aren't responsive. The idea of using twice a day uh, aspirin comes from the thromboxane, um, the effects of aspirin on thromboxane. But certainly there are consensus guidelines, or there are guidelines out there, um, like in the American Journal of Hematology, that give you times at which twice a day aspirin is appropriate. So my patient's on a daily aspirin. Her platelets have been, since we've kept her iron pretty vigorously uh, repleted, we used IV iron initially, uh, her platelets have been in the range of 800 to 900,000. She had a CVST um, about five years after she was diagnosed, and I discussed with her starting interferon therapy. She was young, um, and interferon therapy I tend to use more in my younger individuals. Uh, her platelets went down. The aspirin was continued, um, but then she had nodes bleed, so I discontinued it because she's been on warfarin because of her CVST. I think there's a lot of um, uncertainty about when to continue anticoagulation and aspirin together in individuals, and I went back and forth on that in, with this patient as well. So we've talked a little bit about risk stratification, um, the role of molecular mutation, some of the key d data supporting upfront therapy, um, and I'm not sure, are we taking questions or are we saving that for the panel? Okay, great. So anyway, thank you very much, um, and I'll be happy to talk about this later.